Today we're going to talk about chapter 10. Um, I'm going to give you a warning beforehand. Now, I'm kind of new to this teaching this child side class. Um, and I hesitated for a long time to teach it because, uh, I don't know, I, it sounds bad, but I mean, I'm a scientist and this material is, is what I would kind of call touchy feel. You know, this is not hardcore science in, in uh, the way I view it anyway. And, um, I, but I embraced this class. I did. Child psych, I really enjoy it. And I embraced it for a reason. And that's because having had uh, two children of my own, I have some definite knowledge to share. And so I thought it was, you know, all my obligation to do so. Um, suffice it to say, though, uh, I still have this belief that this is somewhat touchy-feely material. Not as touchy-feely as counseling, God forbid, but you know, touchy-feely material, and uh, this chapter is perhaps one of the most, uh, probably the most touchy-feely of them. You know, to me it's like, it doesn't have substance, it doesn't have form, it doesn't have anything solid. It's like talking about smoke, you know, the shape of smoke, and it's just, whatever, okay? I'll do, I'll do the best I can with this material. Um, some of it is more interesting than others, especially with discussions of gender. Um, but I'll, I'll do the, the best I can. The self is kind of a funky term, uh, and, and it's it's an interesting concept. Uh, at some point, we're going to talk about uh, Marcus and Kitayama's model of the self and uh, how it changes across culture. But suffice it to say, the self refers to the characteristics, emotions, and beliefs people have about themselves. William James distinguished between two different aspects of the self. We still kind of sort of recognize this, the I-self and the me-self. The I-self is this awareness of a separate existence. We've seen this earlier when we refer to um, um, theory of mind. If you call theory of mind, was this understanding that other people are somehow separate and different from you and have their own existence. And so we find that this concept of the I-self is intimately, intimately connected, or the development of the self is intimately connected to cognitive development because you need to understand, I mean, how can you possibly understand the existence of separateness until you can establish um, object permanence, right? This idea that things exist and so. Uh, the me-self is more descriptive, how you would describe yourself, okay? We're going to talk about self-concepts and self-representations, and those are really just uh, the me-self. Self-evaluations are judgments that people make. Um, these evaluations, uh, both positive and negative, work together to, to create the basis for self-esteem, uh, how we feel about ourselves. Um, and, and of course, we can have different self-esteem in academic senses and physical senses and different uh, environments in different situations. I have, uh, I mean, I clearly have a different self-esteem when I'm up in front of the class. I feel confident and I feel good. Uh, when I'm in a new social setting, I feel shy. I know, I'm shy, believe it or not. I'm shy. I have different, different evaluations of myself. Um, you have a profile in multiple contexts. That's a pretty neat idea. Um, so this notion of self, children are not born with a sense of self. Um, again, I'm going to pull out Sigmund Freud, <coughs> Sigmund Freud for a moment and uh, remind you that Sigmund Freud describes when an infant is born, if you recall, of course, it, the ego, the superego, the three parts which develop and interact, but the baby's born with just an id, which is just gimme, 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 gimme. doesn't have any sense of existence, doesn't have any sense of what, and no matter how you define the word self. Because if you recall, it was in fact the ego that was uh, roughly translates as self or the me or something like that. And so the ego is something that doesn't develop until later in life. So we find some connections here between, between uh, Freud's concept and, and this, this discussion here. Um, the, for me, they construct a working model of the self. It changes with experience and interactions. Um, the I self and the me self write cognitive constructions, that is to say that the development of the self is intimately related to cognitive development. Uh, you need social interaction to create a self, that makes sense. 
but there's also biological influences and we're not surprised. So basically this slide is just saying the same thing we keep on saying is we talk about the self as though it's somehow separate, but clearly you need cognitive development, you need social development, you need social interactions, you need biological input. So, you know, the whole pile just, as always, jokes together. Um, oh my God. Feel free to pause and read this whole thing. The development of the self across ages. Sounds interesting. Okay. So as we said, newborns do not possess an eye self. They begin to understand eventually that their, uh, their physical sensations and emotions are somehow separate and different from others. Um, they also learn that they can affect other people. That is they, uh, one of the favorite games that children have, uh, babies have, is the one, throw the rattle, make the grown up, pick it up and give it back. Hee hee hee. Throw the rattle, pick it up, give it back. Oh my God! They'll play that game for 20 hours if you let them. Um. Uh, yeah. Okay. Personal agency. This is this uh, idea, this realization that their actions have an effect on the environment. Obviously, we just we just played that rattle game. Um. Self-efficacy, the belief that an individual can accomplish goals. And um, this isn't a surprise. This connects us to uh, about Eric Erickson now. Because remember, in Eric Erickson's theory, he talked about um, the different stages of social development. And he said, uh, basically, that there was conflicts that children went through. And they could either solve these conflicts successfully or unsuccessfully. Regardless if uh, they, they were successful or not, they were going to move to the next stage as they physically got older. And if you recall, one of Erickson's most important stages was industry versus inferiority. And that is a stage in social development where children are, are tackling this issue. Can I control the world? Can I accomplish goals? Can I be successful? Okay? Versus, of course, this failure to feel that way. And so it, it uh, the self-efficacy would they then later form the basis for the child's sense of self-esteem. Uh, the me self begins to emerge as a separate as the child forms a separate existence. Um, the rouge test is very cute. You take a while the kid isn't you know while while you pretend that you're wiping the kid's cheek, you put a spot of rouge on the kid's cheek. And then uh, what happens is the toddler are on 21 um, months of age. What happens is then they, they, the kids go to the mirror and um, the question is, will they touch the spot of rouge on their face or will they touch the spot of rouge on the mirror? Okay. And for a while, um, infants don't get it. And so um, that reminds me, I remember with my kids, one of their favorite games, you, you, we, we call it baby in the mirror game. And you take your kid and you hold him up to the mirror and you go, oh, how's the baby in the mirror feeling today? You know, and you, your kid's like, oh, go, go, go. And he thinks that there's another kid out there. All right. Um, <laughs> it works. Trust me. We got to do something to amuse them. And um, at some point, though, they do recognize that that spot of rouge that they see in the mirror is not actually there, but is actually here. Uh, we find that some children it's later, some not. Uh, chimpanzees can generally pass this kind of a test, uh, developing, I mean, in fact, I've, I've seen this in other, other contexts as being evidence of theory of mind, of the development of theory of mind. And chimpanzees can pass this test, but dogs will never figure it out, okay? It's always like, what's up with the dog in the mirror, man? And so here's a percent of children who, um, figured it out, you know, at nine months, none. At 15 to 18 months, about a quarter, and around 21 to 24, they're starting to all figure it out. Um, children, children start to refer to themselves using pronouns, me tired, or using their own names. Um, concrete behaviors. Yeah, when children are young, their, their self-concept is very concrete. I'm a boy. I am strong. I am a very, very concrete rather, rather than I am beautiful or something. Self descriptions become more abstract with age. I am a fair person, something like that. Here's an interesting one. What self descriptions might look like? Again, these are pretty, pretty long, but 
I live with my mom and my grandma in a little blue house. So this is like self-description. Who am I? Who am I at five years old? I'm a really, really great at soccer. I play a lot better than last year when I first started. At about eight. I'm in fifth grade this year. Uh, I guess that's more like 11. I'm in fifth grade this year. I have lots of friends because I'm pretty nice to people. We're starting to see some real concrete to more abstract. Okay? I'm great at soccer. I'm nice to people. I have a really good sense of humor. Okay? So we're starting to get more and more mid adolescence. I am not a simple person. <laughs> it's about as abstract as you can get. Um, here is a business card. I like this. My, my daughter wrote this for career day at her school. She um, opted for a lawyer. <laughs> Whatever. She opted for a lawyer and for extra credit, she brings in props. So she dresses, and this is, by the way, this is very cute. Um, she said, if you're a lawyer and you're a boy, you wear a suit. And if you're a lawyer and you're a girl, you wear a tight skirt. <laughs> where she got that from. So she makes herself some business cards as part of her prop and here's a business card that she wrote. And this is kind of an interesting idea because um, my business card contains those pieces of information that I think are important for other people in business to know about me. Right? That, that's the point of a business card. And so in some ways it's a self-description. So here's my daughter's self-description. Job, lawyer, gender, female, age, seven, eye and hair color, brown, favorite color, purple. <laughs> so, I guess if you're seven years old, and you're my, my daughter anyway, my daughter at seven years old, and you want to know something important about her, favorite color clearly fits into the realm of what's important. If you want to know her, you should know her favorite color, right? So that's kind of a neat, a neat idea. Um, again, this is not a surprise. This concept of the development of the self is related to all kinds of factors. In particular, cognitive development is needed, and we find that the development of the self is very uh, mirrors in many ways Piaget's stages of uh, cognitive development. Language is necessary for communication of ideas and expression and the whole social development. And social comparison is needed as children evaluate with their peers. And we're going to come to this in a little bit with um, when we talk about gender development, because some kids develop early and some kids develop late. And this evaluation, like early developing kids are, are comparing with um, later developing kids, and they might have a more positive self-concept just because they're more successful. And sure they are, because they're biologically more advanced or something. So that you need this comparison with your peers to really make it work. Uh, larger cultural systems. Again, this is this is interesting, but I mean, this is a, it's just a heck of a lot of words saying what we say over and over and over, and that is that you cannot talk about the development of the self as somehow independent and separate from the development of the development of the development of, and it's influenced by biological forces. It's influenced by language. It's influenced by cognitive development. It's influenced by the culture that we grow up in and the influences of it. So, I mean, this is not something new to us. It's just a bunch of words saying things we've seen over and over and over. Eric Erickson believed that the issue of identity development was primary during adolescence. That was his um, Erickson stages of social development. He had identity development as the main crisis uh, conflict during adolescence. Uh, children comp hmm. compare their real self with their ideal self and they take on roles. Okay, They begin to um, join groups. Um, and so what happens is that these kids have all kinds of different uh, self-representation concepts and they all have to be uh, sewn together into a single sense of identity during adolescence. Okay? I don't know who Marcia is. I mean, Marcia, Mar Marcia, Marcha, I don't know. Um, proposed identity development in the adolescence has two aspects, crisis and commitment. Crisis is just comparing who we are, comparing the actual self to the ideal self, a commitment is uh, actually 
making decisions about who we are. And uh, using these two together, Marcia, Marcia, somebody, I don't know, says we can have a degree of crisis where this, you know, how, how much comparison are we making between our real and actual selves? Very little, very much between our ideal and actual selves. And how much commitment, how, how are we just to, to this? And, you know, it's kind of a neat idea, but it creates four types of individuals. And I'm always hesitant to um, accept this concept of typing people, because as soon as you type somebody, you're just sort of opening the door to stereotypes. I mean, that's that's the point. Well, we create four types. Do these, are these, is this, is there a use to these four types? Well, according to March ER, there's these four types, right? Identity achievement, identity diffusion, identity foreclosure, identity moratorium. And what happens is that children that have identity achievement tend to have more positive psychological, emotional, and behavioral traits. Children that, that demonstrate identity diffusion tend to have more interpersonal problems. Okay? So there is some uh, purpose, some point to these types. They're not just a, you know, there's something there, right? The types have some meaning. Um, but again, I, I hesitate. And again, again, I mean, when we label somebody or something, we label them for a reason. We label them to allow us to predict certain characteristics about them. And therefore, if a child is labeled as achieving identity achievement, whatever, having identity achievement, then we can predict certain characteristics about that child. Um, again, though, it just seems like it's opening the door to more and more stereotypes. Along with um, this development of the self, one of the most important parts of the development of the self is an ethnic identity, a racial identity. A racial identity is an understanding of a child's ethnic background and a feeling of belonging within a minority group. So some children, on top of having to develop a, a general sense of self, need to identify, uh, develop a racial identity. Again, though, I mean, we're going to say, like, oh, we'll talk about racial identity, but clearly this is related to the bigger question of um, development of the self, because clearly this development and how this runs up will clearly influence how children's self-esteem establishes and their self social comparisons work. I mean, it's, it's just clearly related to uh, the general self as well. It's just part of the self. Uh, adolescents who are members of an ethnic minority in their culture have the additional task of, okay, yeah. Uh, Finney proposed three stages of uh, identity development, or ethnic identity, uh, racial identity, whatever, and um, call it unexamined ethnic identity, ethnic identity search, and resolution of conflict. And in fact, we're going to come across stages in, um, for uh, children that are homosexual, we're going to find the same kinds of stages, the same kind of, we haven't looked yet, we're starting to think there's something going on, and then we finally are happy, okay? And so we find that, um, that, that children go through these stages um, as part of their general development of the self. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, this is particularly difficult, though. Um, I do a lot of this kind of work, in fact, at my church. The, because, you know, my church, it's a Korean church. And uh, there's, just, I mean, I, I guess I, I'm going to keep it simple. The problem is that these parents are trying to push on their children, you're Korean first and American second. You're Korean first and American second. But these kids are going to school and they see, if I adopt this ethnic identity, I'm going to make myself an outsider. So they think about themselves, generally speaking, as American first and Korean as sort of a small part of that. I am an American who happens to have ancestors who are Korean. Whereas your parents are pushing them, no, you're Korean, who happen to live in America. And the kids are like, no, 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 I'm American and happen to have Korean ancestors. And so it's clearly a different idea because, of course, 
a child who is Korean has different expectations than a child who's American and has her. And so there's this real problems with these um, children that are developing this sense of identity because the sense of identity they develop is not necessarily the one that their parents want them to have and create some real issues in the community. Uh, Self-evaluation. Children begin to evaluate their performance on past during the toddler years, okay? Uh, the opinion, global self-evaluation seven. Self-esteem may be unrealistically high, but later on when the kids go to school, they start to have social comparison, they understand. Uh, I, I've seen this before, say for example, when children are very young, every kid, if you ask them, they say, I am I run fast. Because they, but then they go to school and they go to gym class and they realize, oh shit, I'm not. Okay, so it's, until you have social comparison, it doesn't, you know, you, you have this uh, exaggerated sense. Uh, independent, don't, uh, yeah, like this is familiar, we said the self-evaluation becomes more negative about 11 or 12, just about the onset of puberty, um, yeah, and then later on, okay. Uh, oh Lord, how, how touchy-feely can you get? Positive self-evaluation has its roots in the quality of care giving and input receives. All right. Um, not a surprise, though, that this positive self-evaluation is related to Eric Erickson's stages of social development. And just as Eric Erickson said, uh, successful conclusion of the earlier stages, the earlier social conflicts, will positively impact later social com uh, conflicts. Con uh, uh, comparison between the real and ideal selves. Um, this is very interesting. In fact, um, one of the the uh, definitions of self-esteem. I like this. This goes way back to uh, William James. And uh, William James had this concept of self-esteem, where self-esteem is a mathematical concept where you you have a ratio of um, things achieved divided by things that you and things that you complete compared to things that you attempt something like that completed things to attempted things and or or um, where you actually are compared to what you would like to be and what happens is if where you are is very close to where you want to be you'll have positive self-esteem you know it's like a fraction the fraction will be a, a high number but if you where you are is radically different or, or far or, or is in particular much smaller than where you want to be, then that fraction becomes very low and self-esteem is low. So that is an interesting idea. It's very similar here. Uh, the actual discrepancy and the degree of social support that a kid receives to deal with it. Um, the level right. This is this is this is uh, troublesome. That it's the, uh, what the child perceives, not the truth that, that matters, but what the child perceives is the truth. There's a strong relationship between self-evaluations and depression, or, or self-esteem in general and depression. Okay, but of course you can't tell which, is, which comes first there. Um, how can you uh, get, give your child positive self-evaluations, how you can raise your self-esteem? Um, I like that. Uh, I mean, this is interesting. As a parent, this is important stuff. But um, at the same time, I am a firm believer that you as a parent can take this too far. And in fact, many, if not most parents, do take this too far. And what happens is they give their, their child unrealistic... I mean, every kid gets a medal. You have a contest, and every kid's a winner. You're all winners! Well, I'm sorry. Uh, at some point, you know, you got to know the realistic, exp you know, re reality of what's going on. And um, again, I get this sometimes, even at the university level, is these children have been fed. And, you know, in fact, there's this song that they now sing at nursery schools, and it says, "I am special, I am special." And I got it. I got it. I mean, that's great. You got to, you got to make sure that these kids feel good about themselves, but. 
here's the deal. I mean, it, 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 it sounds horrible, but if every kid is special, then no kid is special. Isn't that the definition of special? And so we find that, yes, every kid does have talents and every kid is special in some way. Um, but what happens is these kids are getting this general um, um, inflated sense of self. And um, I even get this at the university level. These kids come in and they believe that they're so great. And I hate to be the bad guy. I hate, I'm not the bad guy. I'm just the bearer of bad news. I hate to be the one. When, when a paper comes to me and it looks like shit, it's my job to tell you it looks like shit. It's not my job to say to you, oh, there's so many pot. If it's shit, it's shit. And that's my job. And I hate to be the one that comes down to do it because it makes me into such a bad guy. But it's the result of this. Okay? Because children are not being given an accurate self-assessment. I gotcha. You got to help these kids. You got to work with these kids. But I'm telling you this. My son, he wrote a story the other day, and um, and, it, and he shows it to me, and he was so proud of it. And I'm like, this is just crap. What are you kidding me? I mean, it, he writes, he's trying to write a fantasy story about a dog that shoots lasers out of his butt, all right? And I'm like, dude, that's just gibberish, okay? If you want to write a real story, we'll talk about a decent story, okay? But you're just sort of, I think this is a... He's just, it's just random gibberish, okay? A dog that shoots lasers out of his butt and farts out of his eyes, that's just gibberish. You're just throwing crap on a page. You can do better is what I told him, okay? Before you think I just slammed on my kid. That was the point, okay? The point was this is shit and you can do better. And to me, that is one of the most important things you can tell your kids. Sometimes what you did sucked. It's not always special. It's not always worthy of a gold star. If it's not your best effort, then it's not good enough. Sorry. I know. That's me. I know. Yeah, Mr. Liberal, right? Yeah, no. Okay? Kids can do better than... It's amazing, in fact, what a kid can accomplish if you uh, challenge them a little bit. Self-regulation is very interesting. Self-regulation is kind of counterintuitive. And again, I mean, I have to pull out Freud. I'm starting to feel sick today. All right, I'm using Freud again. And if you recall, when children are born, they develop uh, the, the, their sense of their sense of um, personality has one component: the id, the gimme, 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 the now, 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 the very opposite of what self-regulation is. So. By definition, when a child is born, they are anti-self-regulation. And in fact, I do a lot of work on self-control, which I'll describe in a minute. But in all of my work, the basic assumption is that we, as creatures, are selfish by nature. That, that's not what I meant. We are um, impulsive by nature. We are gimme, 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 now, 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 by nature. And... Um, and it, 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 it's only through a very complicated developmental process that we ever learn to put the brakes on that gimme thing, okay? So self-regulation, by definition, is the ability to monitor and control behavior. To me, controlling behavior is self-control. I am a behaviorist. However, self-regulation also encompasses the regulation of emotions, the regulations of thoughts, and the ability to change things to meet the situation. Okay? Um, basically, in all of these situations, it includes the ability to inhibit your first response, okay? to resist interferences, I like that, uh, avoid distractions or something, and to persist even when we don't enjoy doing something. We do it anyway. Okay? Uh, various aspects of self-regulation are associated with a lot of positive outcomes. Clearly, um, I, I, I'm going to get to this in a minute, but it, it, this, they're huge. If a child can self-regulate, they will be successful in life. So let me take it on as a side note. This is, like I said, because my research area is in, in fact, self-control. Self-control by definition. Most decisions are ultimately between two choices. I like this. When you, when you sit down and make choices, okay, there's almost always going to be an easy choice and a hard choice, or fun or not fun, something like that. 
And let's, let's take it simple. The alarm clock rang this morning. You either could A, get out of bed, or B, hit the snooze button. One is easy, one is hard. Um, for breakfast, you could have a donut or bran. <laughs> you know, whatever, okay? One is easy, one is hard, one is fun, is one is not fun, one is, you know, something like this. One tastes good and yummy, one doesn't, whatever it is. Easy, hard, basically. And when we do make choices, which inevitably we do, they have consequences. And those consequences tend to be twofold. Twofold, where's my camera? There it is. Twofold. And they are consequences that are on the spot immediate and consequences which are delayed in time. Okay? Here's the drill. If you make a choice and the consequences feel good at the moment, chances are the consequences are bad in the long run. And if something is difficult right now or not so much fun right now, chances are the consequences later are better. Okay? This is what self-control is all about. To make a self-control decision, we must choose the thing that is hard at the moment or not fun or whatever, but, or has the right consequences which may be unpleasant at the moment, but tend to lead to better consequences in the long run. Okay, we could talk about, you know, smoking. <laughs> I want to quit smoking. Okay. <laughs> so the act of smoking feels good now, but it kills me later. The act of not smoking feels terrible now if you've ever been a smoker. <laughs> the act of not smoking sucks, but it's better for you in the long run. Dig it? If it feels good now, you're probably going to have to pay a price later. Self-control is the ability to, a, remember this is a subsidiary of self-regulation, self-control is the behavioral act of making a decision which feels not so good at the moment, but which is better for us in the long run. We, we, uh, but it's definitely related to self-regulation, as you can tell. Here's a classic study. This thing was awesome. This is Walter Michelle's study. In this study, they, they brought in these kids that were like four or five years old, something like that, and they gave the kids a game to play. Okay, here's a game we're going to play. We're going to put a pretzel rod on the table here and have a bell. Here's a drill, says the researcher. I also have right here a yummy marshmallow. Oh, God, kids like marshmallows. All right, so now what happens is they say, okay, I'm going to put the pretzel on the table. And I'm going to leave with a marshmallow. If you can wait until I come back into the room, you can have the marshmallow. But, you know, if you just can't resist the temptation and you just want that pretzel really bad, you just ring this bell and I'll come right back in as soon as you ring that bell and you can eat that pretzel. Okay? But then, no, no, no more marshmallow. Okay? So now the kids are just like, oh my God, I want that marshmallow, okay? And so some kids were able to wait, some were not. I mean, a lot of things. But it was crazy, actually. It was a crazy deal because kids that were able to wait for a marshmallow, well, they were older, okay? Well, that's not a shock because the, we talked just, we, we said the word development of self-regulation. You need to develop it with time. So older children could wait longer. But what's scary is that children that came from uh, rich families were much better at than children that came from poor families at, de at demonstrating this behavior. And I was like, okay. So then they followed these kids up, and they were 17 years old. And then they, uh, the kids went and took the SAT test. And then they compared how long could the kid wait for the marshmallow when he was four years old what score did the kid get on the SAT test when they were 17? And it was just incredible. It was just an incredible correlation. And so what it comes down to is if a kid can wait for a marshmallow at four years old, their SAT scores are much higher when they go to college. Now, if we take this out to its logical conclusion, the SAT score predicts, this is correlational, but the SAT score a kid receives predicts success in college. So if a kid can wait for a marshmallow when they're four years old, then they'll be more successful in college. Yeah. It means they'll get a better job. That means they'll make more money. That means... But you want to know the real shit now. You want to go back to the beginning. Those children that came from rich families could wait longer for the marshmallow. Oh. 
Gotcha. So if they could wait longer, they became rich. They had children who then could wait for the marshmallow, who then became... Really? Yeah, the rich get richer or the poor get poorer, buddy. So something is going on here. Clearly, if a kid can wait for a marshmallow, this kid has the ability to demonstrate self-regulation. The self-regulation that is required for the kid to stay home and study instead of going out with his friends. The self-regulation that is required when there's a fight at school, it takes some real self-regulation to back off and say, hey, I'm not in fact going to pursue this fight because it's going to get me in trouble. You know, the self-regulation required whether it be behavioral self-regulation or emotional self-regulation. The self-regulation required to be successful in life was simply reflected in the ability to wait for the marshmallow. Okay, oh, oop, we read, oh, I got off there. Okay, um, I don't want to get into this. This is interesting. I mean, this is like, um, this is my research area. I, not only do I, um, I not only do I research an understanding of self-control, but um, why we suck at it. Okay, because uh, we all. I mean, most of us are pretty good at self-control, right? You well, you're taking an online class. You damn well better have some self-control and self-regulation. But um, we all suck to some degree, and I, uh, in my research, I explore different reasons that we suck at self-control. Uh, I'm not really going to get into all of these by any means. In in my uh, current line of research, I've been mostly um, in my dissertation. I was focusing on this as a as a reason that we fail at self control. But in recent years, I've been focusing more on this as a reason we fail at self control. This uncertainty being this concept that, um, as I said, you know, self control is the act of doing something which feels bad at the moment, but it's better for us in the long run. And it's like, it doesn't always work that way. You know, it's like uh, a guy quit smoking and then get hit by a bus the next day. You know, things that feel bad at the moment don't always have positive long-term consequences. There's always an uncertainty involved. If a kid stays home and studying, and instead of going to a party, does it guarantee they're going to have a better grade? No, it doesn't. So this uncertainty is inherent in the world, and it makes self-regulation much harder. Uh, infants are born with no ability. Uh, a primitive behavioral control might might form blah, 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 exhibited in the ability to turn away from loud sounds or yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, compliance as an indicator of self-regulation. That's interesting. Um, these next two slides are actually kind of confusing, but. Uh, basically compliance is the when a child does something they don't want to do and um, clearly it's, it's something in, in, in an important part of self-regulation um, what was this again the percentage of children that are able to show self-regulation at 14 22 33 and 45 months and uh, they're being asked to stop something they enjoy doing or to continue doing something they don't enjoy. Okay? And so um, this would be, let's say, stop doing something that you're having fun with. Stop jumping on the bed. Will the kids do it? As the kids get older, okay, they get better at stopping and jumping on the bed when you tell them to do it. No, no, here's if they agree with your request. I don't remember. Whatever. This was. Uh, Keep, uh, oh yeah, pick up your toys, something that you don't enjoy doing, but keep doing it. How many will actually do it? I don't know. It's interesting. Um, temperament, self-regulation, yeah, what a surprise. Oh, okay. Yeah, the self-regulation is, is an interesting thing because uh, that part of your brain which really is involved in self-regulation when people are being asked to um, inhibit their first response do something that's not what you would uh, do by nature you know that um, you know don't do the thing that feels automatic to you or something like that it, it's a frontal lobes as we had talked about earlier, the frontal lobes don't completely myelinate until the kid's about 21 years old. Remember, we talked about that during adolescent development and how that might um, 
help a child to um, form an identity or, or an occupation, right? To form an identity or an occupation. And so we find that this, um, this area, which is really responsible for self-regulation, isn't fully developed and cooked until the kid's 21. So if we think about the concepts here, um, it's a scary thought. The kid's brain, the one, that part of the brain that is uh, regulation, regulating impulsive behavior, isn't cooked until the kid's 21. And so there's a lot of people that are using this uh, evidence saying kids should not be driving at 16, okay? Because the act of driving is a giant game of self-regulation, okay? Somebody cuts you off on the road, self-regulate. Uh, should I cut in front of this person? Self-regulate. Should I, you know, I mean... The decision making required in driving, which is boom, it's not, you can't stop and think about. The decision making required in driving requires an inhibition of, and yet this regulation, this, this area of the brain isn't fully cooked yet. Um, modeling, yeah. Um, yeah, this, I, this is interesting. How do kids develop self regulation? And, um, all right, I'm going to remind you the kids in the marshmallows, and if the kids had a rich parents, then they could wait longer for the marshmallows. Assumingly, if the parents are rich, the parents themselves could self-regulate because they must have done self-regulation to make themselves more successful, to make themselves rich, to have the children that then could wait for the marshmallows. Remember the game. So how does this work? There was this bowling game. Right, this is really kind of a neat study. Um, this bowling game, I, I, I remember having these when I was growing up. I, I don't know that any of you are old enough to remember these, but you would. Uh, it wasn't really bowling, but it was a disc. It was a round disc, and it was on a table, almost sort of like a um, air hockey or something like this. But you would you would slide it down, and the the pins would would you'd hit the pins, and they would go up actually because they were attached to the top. And depending on how many you would hit, boom, they would go up. And then you could play this game, and uh, you could get scores in this game. And so these adults played this game, and then um, children watched them. And in one group of in one group, what happened is uh, the adults they rewarded themselves if they just scored ten or higher in a game. Okay, rewarded themselves. I think it was with a bowl of M and M's. Let me take some M and M's. And in another group. The the uh, the adults they only rewarded themselves with the M and M's if they scored higher than twenty, okay, which is you know a harder game, and so in the first group the adults were basically rewarding themselves for everything, and in the second one the adults were rewarding themselves only if they achieved a certain amount, okay. So plenty of games went where this group did not reward themselves. So the kids watched one of these two, and then later on, the children were basically like, play the game, there's the M&Ms, do what you want to do. And lo and behold, the kids rewarded themselves on the game in exactly the same way that they watched the parents, or, or not their parents, but that's the point, I guess, right? But the grown-ups, okay? So children are watching, and we, you know, they're, they're not just picking up real specific things like how do I behave when grandma's here, right? No, they, they're learning really, really, really general things like self-regulation. What is the appropriate amount of self-regulation for me to develop, uh, to demonstrate? All right. Whew. Now, gender, okay? This is, in many ways, um, they stuck in the development of the self and the development of gender, and I can, I can dig how they're sort of Right, yeah, gotcha. Yet at the same time, I mean, with, with the types of chapters we've been having, I think it would have been more logical to separate these two as separate chapters. And I was tempted to, in fact, put this as two completely separate lectures. One, the development of the self. One, the development of gender. I gotcha how they're connected. But yet at the same time, right, it is what it is. Um, so, one important part of a child's developing sense of self is gender. There you go. You knew there would be a connection, right? Um, are you male or female? It sounds pretty straightforward. I mean, we've, we've talked about XX and XY, right? But um, it's not that simple. Um, 
we can talk about gender, uh, the traits, uh, gender role, and understanding what it means to be a boy or a girl, clearly influenced by socialization. Gender concept, the degree of understanding that sex is a permanent, unchangeable feature. Okay. Sex type behavior, behavior that matches gender role expectations of a particular culture. Um, one of the one of the interesting studies in gender development involved David Reimer. David Reimer uh, was born, and uh, David Reimer was getting circumcised when David Reimer's physician screwed up, uh, and the circumcision was so bad that the mother says, "Okay, you know what? Let's just finish this up. Let's just." get the whole thing off, and uh, we'll, we'll just raise David as a girl, all right? So they just surgically modified David and uh, raised, raised her, threw a dress on her and treated her like a girl, okay? Um, but, you know, the whole time David was growing up, David was just like, this isn't right. They didn't tell David, you know, David didn't know. I was like, this, this isn't right, this isn't right. And at some point in his life, um, around 14, I just got so much, he just said, I can't do this. This is, isn't, I, I, I just, this isn't right. I don't feel right. I don't feel good. Um, and he goes back to and tries to become a boy, but now he doesn't know what to do and he doesn't understand what he's doing. And by the way, he, he ended up going into uh, getting pretty heavily involved in drugs and other problems. And uh, he ended up killing himself when he was about 19. And this is a an interesting story. Basically, that uh, what's the point of it is that we can talk about gender, and and a lot of people are going to say, "Oh, you know, you're you're raising your girls to be girly and blah 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 blah." And there's some truth. We're going to talk about some socialization, nature and nurture, okay? But nature's role in gender is a powerful, powerful thing. It cannot be denied, okay? It cannot. Yes, socialization and what we do to our kids are influence them. Don't get me wrong. Uh, puberty, the process of physical maturation that leads to the physical capability to reproduce. Wow, that sounds so simple. So how, is it, how come it's such a big deal, right? Um, generally characterized by rapid increases in height. Oh my God, my kid is just growing like an inch a day. Um, and weight and strength, as well as changes in the amount and distribution of body muscle and body fat. Um, the the uh, uh, at the testes and the ovaries begin producing eggs and sperm. Uh, secondary sexual characteristics including breasts, body growth, uh, pubic hair, underarm hair, facial hair, and voice changes. Uh, yeah. Physical changes of puberty. Mm -hmm. Triggered by different sex hormones. Uh, yeah, whatever. Oh, God, two of the words. Okay, here's one. What happens during puberty? This is always cute. Um, this is the average height of boys and girls. And at some point here, around 10 years old, the average height of girls exceeds the average height of boys. Look at this kid. I always feel bad when I see this picture. I feel bad because she's looking at him going, you've got to be kidding me, kid. Are you joking? Meanwhile, he's trying like hell to impress her, but he's like a whole head shorter than she is, and she's just laughing. Inside, she's just laughing at him. What are you doing, you little child? But he's trying his damnedest, all right? But then somewhere around 14, it flips back, and boys exceed girls by quite a bit, okay? Um, puberty is related to adolescence. I like this image. This was this was an image which is uh, comes from a different uh, different textbook completely. But this was the description of adolescence, and this is the length of adolescence. The adolescence as defined by the distance between first period and marriage. And in 1890, women's first period was at 11, 12, 13, 14, almost 15 years old. In the year 1995, their first period was at 11, 12 and a half. Now clearly this is something which is much earlier today. Even now it is, oh God, what is it, 15 years later. 
I guarantee you this number is back here somewhere, okay? Much earlier still. Over here we've got um, marriage. Marriage's average age was 22. The marriage average age is 21, 22, 23, 25. And again, even here in um, America, this number is more like here, okay? Uh, 20, probably 28 even. Uh, so the, at this interval, even now in 2000 and whatever it is, right? I don't want to date my lectures. <laughs> um, it's more like 15 to 16 years. It used to be seven and a half years. Um, yeah, that's that's crazy stuff. Uh, puberty is a confusing and awkward time. It has body image. Um, children can either mature early or mature late. Some are early maturing and some are late maturing. Those children are early maturing. Have there are consequences to both early and late maturation. Uh, girls that are early maturing. Uh, perceive themselves as too fat, okay? Uh, whereas late maturing girls see themselves as too thin. And um, there are consequences. And there are body images associated. Early maturing girls tend to have friends that are older. They tend to be more likely to engage in delinquency. They have more problems in school. The problem is really the early maturing boys and girls what happens is uh, they are treated by other children as well as by adults as though they are in fact older. Um, and so you've got these girls that are like boom, 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 but cognitively they still should be playing with Barbie dolls. Okay, That's the stage you're at. Yet they're not being treated that way. They're like if, if this girl with the big baboo and she's playing with Barbies and people are like what's wrong with you? You know, And the girl picks up on that and goes okay Apparently, I'm not supposed to be playing with Barbies, but she's that's not where she, she's at Barbie. She's at the Barbie stage. Why the hell is everybody pushing me to not? Because she's got, and so I look like, and I'm treated that way. Okay, it's real problems. With boys, though, it's a little different. Early maturation is a really, it's positive for a boy's self-image. Uh, I, shit, I can still remember seventh or eighth grade. There was one kid in our school, one one boy. That little bastard could grow a full beard, you know, at seventh grade. It was, you know, he comes back from Thanksgiving. And it was like the most popular kid in the school. Was he the most popular because he was early maturing? Yes, that's exactly why, okay? And so what happened was he became the class president. Why? Because he, he could grow a beard when he was 12. Um, early maturing boys have an advantage in sports. Um, I think I've talked about this previously, that um, when it comes to boys, the ability to perform sports is the most important skill they can have among other boys. And I mean, this is across all cultures. I mean, in almost every culture around, all boys assess their fighting skills, you know? Um, in, in Native American cultures, all boys had to participate in fighting games. I mean, it's just every culture in existence. Here in America, we tend not to have fighting, although boys, that's all they do. God, do you ever see boys? Boys are so stupid. They swing sticks at each other. It's just what they do. Boys are dumb. But sports is another way in which they can assess their fighting skills or something like that. Um, uh, deeper voices are more attractive, especially to the girls. Early to maturing boys tend to engage in more delinquent behaviors. Again, they're treated as though they're older. They tend to have friends that are older. They tend to, they, they get themselves into situations that they're not prepared to handle. They look bigger, and therefore they get at, you know pulled into a fight or something like that. But cognitively, emotionally, and socially, they have not developed to the same level that they are physically. Early maturing boys felt more hostile and distressed. Uh, late maturing boys feel uncomfortable, especially in social comparison situations. Remember, the most one of the most important concepts in the development of the self was social comparison, not just. Who am I as an individual, or cognitive development, blah, 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 social comparison. And clearly in, a, in a, a group, I mean, I don't know how many girls and how many boys are watching this, but I'm going to tell you, this is a fact, girls. 
the most important things that boys compare themselves to is sports and the ability to be successful at sports. Okay, and late maturing boys just can't compete in that sense. Okay, uh, sexual attraction. Woohoo! All right. So eventually, kids start to become. You know, girls stop being icky and they start being cute. Um, in fact, I, 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 my son is just at the point where he's not, I mean, I, I, he's got, he's got girlfriends, he's had girlfriends for a while, but, uh, he's in some, a summer class over at Terry County College, a summer program over there, and he's taking different classes, and, um, uh, because of filled classes or whatever, he ended up in, uh, yoga, we didn't pick yoga, but he ended up in yoga, and, uh, He's just, oh, Dad, give me out of yoga, give me out of yoga. And I'm like, why? And he's like, it's almost all girls. And I'm like, dude, isn't that the point? If it's almost all girls, isn't that a good thing? And he's like, I guess. <laughs> you know, he hasn't completely internalized that that's a positive thing yet. But he'll figure it out. Uh, sexual orientation, the tendency to be attracted to people of the same sex, of the opposite, or both. All right. Researchers estimate that from 2 to 10% of adults identify themselves as gay, lesbian, or bisexual. That's a pretty broad range, 2 to 10%. Wow. Uh, apparently, researchers have no idea what the hell they're talking about. Homosexual men and women report having had cross-gender interests. Um, uh, homosexuality is not the same as gender identity disorder. I want to make sure that we're clear on that. Gender identity disorder is a person who is just dissatisfied with, uh, and uncomfortable with who they are in their biology. Um, most uh, people that are homosexual or lesbian are just fine with being a man or a woman. They're just not attracted to, you know, whatever. That, that's different. The sexual orientation is not the same as this. Okay? Is not the same. Uh, here's uh, identity development, just like we had, I had referred to earlier. Um, children that, that are homosexual will, in fact, have this have this extra requirement put on them in their development of the self, just like the racial identity earlier. And so it's sort of a little extra on top of what you already have to deal with. And so there's these four stages, sensitization, where the kids are starting to realize something's not right, identity confusion, at just at that same time when they're trying to develop uh, their identity, they don't know what the hell to do, identity assumption, they kind of assume they know what's going on, but they haven't really committed yet. Okay. Uh, biology, oh my gosh. Yeah, um... I'm going to kind of zip through it, but suffice it to say, this this is a big deal. This this whole is homosexuality a uh, something you're born with or something that you choose to do, and uh, it's got religious overtones clearly and stuff. But uh, it comes down to this. I'll tell you, there was this one um, Catholic bishop. I want to say the bishop of Cincinnati or something, and he wrote an article. Um, Basically, it was it was a, an opinion, an op-ed piece or something, saying that he believed that uh, homosexuality was in fact um, had biological influences. That there was some biology involved. Okay. Now the Catholic Church came down hard on this guy. They came down hard on this bishop and said, "Dude, no way! No, 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 no! Boom!" All right. They made him retract it. It was bad. Well, why would that be? Why why is that a problem? Because this is it. Okay. The Catholic Church, well, not just the Catholic, sorry guys, but uh, they, they believe that homosexuality is a sin. Now I want to put it this way. Being short is a sin. You're like, dude, serious? Being short is a sin? No, how the hell can I, how can that be a sin? Because I can't choose to be short. It just is what it is. If you're short, you're short. You can't be a sin for something you can't choose. And that's what it comes down to is if, if there's any acknowledgement ever that there's biology involved, then you can't call it a sin, right? Because just like it's it's silly to say it's a sin to be short, right? That's just silly. Therefore, to say if you acknowledge that there's biology involved, it's a sin to be gay. I was like, 
Okay, that doesn't make any sense if you accept biology, does it? The entire argument just flushes out the toilet. And that's why this Catholic bishop was just, just slammed hard for saying such a thing. Okay? So I want to show briefly some of the um, evidence in it. Um, there are physical differences, okay, between homosexuals and uh, the brains of, of, of uh, people that demonstrate homosexual behavior and the brains of people that do not. Um, there are all kinds of different things, like, um, uh, I, uh, well, you know what, I, I, I mean, this was testosterone things. Uh, they have different, here, like, here, this is, the, the, what is this, the INAH3, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, a heterosexual man, this is what it looks like in the brain. A homosexual man, this is what it looks, I mean, they're just radically different. They have different looks to them. There are several different parts, different connections, different places. There's even literal differences in the hands, okay? The hands are different between homosexual and heterosexual. It's kind of hard to describe, but if you read through this, the uh, typical male right hand looks like this, such that the ring finger is longer than the index finger. The typical female hand is such that the ring finger is slightly longer than the index finger. Up there, I, I, got, it, I got it worked out. The typical homosexual man and the heterosexual man have these differences. You see, uh, let me see where I'm, I'm now like this way. And so we find that the typical homosexual man has a... Whatever. The point is that there are actual differences. You're typical. There's lots of room for exceptions. Um, but these are, there are physical, not just brain differences, but I mean literally, okay? Just like that. And so we find that um, there's all kinds of differences. I mean, we could talk about the, the, this particular area of the brain that's the same as blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's just craziness, okay? Or here, this is very interesting. Um, clearly, if uh, there's two boys that are twins and one is gay, there's a 25% chance the other will be gay. That's a pretty high probability. If they're identical twins and one is gay, then there's a 50% chance that the other one is gay. Wow, okay? Clearly, there's a genetic component. Why is it not 100? Because it's not all biology. It's a uh, very interesting video, by the way. If you read this, uh, watch this video, it talks about the role of epigenetics and how literally, I, I, it sounds kind of silly, but we could talk about, remember, the genetic material. Along our genetic material is the, uh, the switches on top, the epigenome, that can be switched on or off. Recall that. And um, so what happens is uh, we could talk about the epigenome turning on or off to identical twins so that the same basic potentials are in there, but different environmental influences can turn them on or off. Uh, related to this, this is very interesting. I, I don't think I have it here. But um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to pull these numbers out of memory, and I'm positive they're not exactly right. But the basic pattern is right, so just listen to the pattern. The, um, if, a, if a woman has one son, the probability that that, that first son will be, a homosex, will, will be homosexual is 5%. I'm making it up, 5 If a woman has two sons, the probability that the second child will be homosexual is 8%. If a woman has three sons, the probability that the third child will be homosexual is 14%. If a woman has four sons, the probability that the fourth son will be homosexual is 25%. Okay? And so with each child, the, uh, the, the probability of homosexuality goes up immensely. And um, the explanation for this, take it with a grain of salt, is that um, in, in hunter-gatherer societies where, where there was much more traditional um, village structure, what would happen is, is uh, if there's four sons that are all living in the same village, they're all competing for the same woman, okay? They're all in competition with each other. And if they were all heterosexual, all chasing the same woman, women, right, they would fight each other and kill each other, and that doesn't genetically make sense. Uh, especially because, remember, we, we talked about evolution is not um, the survival of 
the individual, but the survival of the genetic material that makes the individual. These four brothers share the same genetic material, and therefore their children, from a genetic perspective, are equally important. Okay, and so what happens is if you have a um, one of these these sons becomes homosexual, this this boy then is uh, he's not a competition for the genetic pool. But he is a resource. That is to say, he, he he can be a hunter. He can bring in the food. He can help with raising the children. He can he can provide all of these resources, but not be in competition. Whatever. Suffice it to say, the, the truth is there. When women are pregnant with their fourth child, their bodies produce different hormones at different points. They, they, there's evidence of this that the hormone uh, flushes that come at different points in different stages seem to be influencing the development of homosexuality uh, boys and girls are different oh wow what a shock um, socialization however has made some of these differences shrink okay because yes girls are wearing pants now instead of always wearing dresses I mean clearly Girls demonstrate better performance in verbal skills uh, by adolescent strengths. Spatial skills superior in males. Uh, girls earn higher grades in math early, but later on are less good. Yeah, whatever. Uh, we talked about that. In fact, we talked about this earlier when we talked about uh, uh, aggression. Boys are more likely to engage in rough play. Uh, yeah, they are. I mean, boys are stupid. They swing sticks. That's what they do. They pick up things and they make a gun out of it. They just do. Um, if they can't find a gun, they'll use their finger. They'll do something. Okay. Um, girls show less exploration, perform better. Da 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 da. Uh, girls are more more likely to exhibit relational aggression, uh, harm social relationships. Blah blah blah. Emotions are different, yeah, okay. Uh, gender development rooted in, oh lord, I don't really want to talk about this, boy, I just didn't talk about it. Socialization, yeah, we do socialize our children. Um, I do not, there has been, it has been politically correct in recent years to blame, uh, to blame, whatever, to say that, um, the way we raise our children. Uh, there's a truth to that, you know. Um, if you go to the toy store, um, they have the pink aisle. You know what the pink aisle is? It's my daughter's favorite aisle, okay? She just wants to go where everything is pink and it's all doll. All right? That's all it is. And, um, you know, we, we do this early. I, I admit it. You know, my boys, the, the boys' rooms are painted blue. The girls' rooms are painted pink. Uh, I mean, we do this stuff. I got it. I got it. Don't you dare deny biology, though. Don't even think that um, gender is just a result of socialization. David Reimer tells us that's not true. Adults limit which behaviors are possible by limiting access to inappropriate situations. Fathers are more guilty of this than mothers. That is to say, um, in particular, if a boy picks up uh, a doll, most fathers are going to be like, dude. Get that thing out of there, right? Um, children uh, observe the models on television, um, the Disney Channel itself, the commercials on the Disney Channel. They clearly show girls playing with specific types of toys and boys playing with specific types of toys. And it tells these kids what they're supposed to do. Um, there's a truth to this. But, you know, there was actually an interesting study done with um, uh, monkeys. What was it? Burbot monkeys? I can't remember. So they take these little monkey babies and they put them in a room full of toys and some of the toys were really typical boy toys and some of the toys were really typical girl toys and uh, by that I mean basically soft doll type things and hard truck kind of things and it was crazy because when you put the boys in the room uh, when the boy monkeys are in the room the boy monkeys are pretty evenly split they'll play with pretty much everything but when you put the girl monkeys in the room uh, they definitely grab the soft, cuddly things. They did not 
want to play with no trucks okay and these monkeys clearly never watched the, the commercials on the Disney Channel and they never got to walk down the pink aisle yet you found a difference between the boy monkeys and the girl monkeys there's a biology there there's a truth there that goes beyond socialization never deny that uh, I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit I, I, I it's coming up on another slide um, Whatever, gender identity, gender stability, gender constancy, blah, blah, blah. This is the one that I find interesting. Gender schema theory. A schema, we know schemas from uh, Piaget. And remember, a schema is that basic understanding of how, uh, remember, schemas were categories or something like that. And it was um, a basic um, understanding of how something is or works. And it simply refers to your, a child's understanding of gender as one of the schemas. Just one of the schemas. It interacts with, remember, skateboarding schema or whatever. It's one of the schemas that develops, albeit a complicated one, but it's a, a schema which develops in relation to the whole structure of other schemas, and it's just the way the child develops, an understanding of how things work and what it means. And clearly, these schemas are influenced by both biology and uh, socialization. Uh, stereotyped uh, preferences, even before they understand their own sex. Uh, yeah, uh, they prefer the toys and stuff. Androgyny. Oh, okay. In the 1970s, researchers reconceptualized masculinity and femininity as two separate dimensions. That's an interesting idea that, um, well, well, whatever. Androgyny, however, refers to a person that has a lot of masculine and a lot of feminine characteristics. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Self-rating of masculinity, self-relating rating of femininity, blah, blah, blah. Okay. The end. Okay. As I said to you, um, this is not my favorite chapter. It's it's interesting, and, I'm, I, and you guys are not me. So... Um, what can I say? If I did not give this chapter a fair shake, it means you spent a little extra time reading the chapter because I did my best, all right? I'll see you next time on chapter 11, and I don't even know what that's about yet, but I'll know the next time I come in here.